Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next installment of the JKMRC um, Friday morning seminar series uh, that take place here at the Indopili Lecture Theater um, every Friday. My name is Katarina, and myself and Karina are um, taking turns introducing the speakers this year. On behalf of the University of Queensland and um, the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ugera and the Turbal tribes, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize our valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today is Professor Andre Van As, who is the group leader of deep mining geoscience research here at the BRC at SMI. Andre is an underground mine geotechnical engineer that has spent most of his 30 year career working on caving operations and caving projects. He has worked on um, or had significant involvement in more than 10 major caving operations in, and projects. And he sits on several cave mining geotechnical review boards. And he was also a recipient of a CSIRO medal in 2001 for developing hydraulic fracturing technology in mining. He has also published widely on cave mining and caving geomechanics. So after 22 years working for Rio Tinto, um, Andre formed his own consultancy in 2018 with focus on providing technical expertise to the cave mining industry. And he has been with BRC since November 2021. Uh, today, he's presenting on challenges of deep mass mining. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to this. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> okay, I can start, right. I'll need the mouse there. Um, so good, good morning, um, everybody. And um, so uh, I guess uh, Katarina's already given you a bit of an introduction about um, who I am and all the rest. So uh, I'll just get straight into it. And I get use this mouse right. So I just just want to say my talk today is 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 really a very high level talk, and uh, I never realised in my CV I had so many. Uh, uh, references to caving in there, but guess what? Today is more about caving, and if you didn't realize that. So, although um, <clears throat> I realize that the, you've got quite a diverse group, you know, we've got different uh, disciplines. So, I wanted to present a little bit at a high level rather than dive into a lot of the detail. And uh, so, for those who are attending that we're hoping to hear more about mass mining, I make some apology because although I'm talking about mass mining, I'm really going to be talking about mass caving. Uh, because I really believe that that's where we're going into the future, you know, and uh, uh, since I've come here, I'm not, I'm not as sure as I was before, but, but I, I do sort of believe, you know, that, uh, that the challenges that we face are around deep uh, cave mining. <clears throat> so uh, a little context here. <clears throat> so first of all, I just want to talk about what is, um, you know, mass mining, uh, what is cave mining? Uh, to give you a bit of a flavor of the, of the issues uh, and where the, where the future of cave mining is going and uh, I guess the challenges that we're facing in that. Now, first of all, what is, um, you know, underground mass mining? So, you know, over the decades, you know, a lot of the modern mining principles and methods have evolved over the past decades. And that's really to write, try and meet the uh, geomechanical and operational problems that are posed in the recovery of these large uh, ore deposits. And th th these are always characterized by, you know, geological um, and all body geometry problems and parameters, uh, I guess. So when selecting a mining method, it's common practice to select the most appropriate method for the ore body, right? For a segment of the ore body and adapt that to the specific mining environment and the specific mining conditions. So the final choice of the mining method will reflect both the engineering properties of the ore body, uh, its setting, the engineering attributes, of the various mining methods. And in, in essence, the mining method selected is determined by the size, the shape, the orientation, 
and the type of the um, ore body to be mined. So what's mass mining? Well, generally, these are considered the more inflexible bulk mining methods, right? So bulk mining means, uh, as opposed to, say, the selective mining methods you might see, like cut and fill, drift and fill, VCR, those types of methods. So mass mining methods are able to exploit the very low, large, you know, low grade, large deposits, and you can mine them on scale. So massive tonnages can come out of these um, uh, the, these types of deposits. And that's, that's the only way you can make it profitable in, in essence, right? So in these cases, the preferred mass mining uh, te techniques for these deposits are typically block caving, panel caving, you know, open stoping, uh, sublevel caving, and so on. So when I talk about mass caving, I'm talking about these types of, of deposits. So let's talk a little bit about what is caving. <clears throat> so you know, what's cave mining? So in essence, cave mining is implemented when you have a very large, uh, low-grade deposit. And um, the way it works, so there's, there's several sort of key drivers for a successful cave. Um, and the first thing we've got to do is we um, undercut the rock mass that we want to cave. So we, we, we basically, <clears throat> we come down uh, however deep, and we set up uh, an infrastructure down here, which is, let's just say, this is what we call the undercut in the production level. And we undercut this, de this, this deposit. And as we undercut this, so we induce and initiate caving, right? So the, the point that I'm trying to make, uh, I guess, is that there are various stages in caving. Um, you start with your cave initiation, which is all about undercutting. And then as your cave, as you draw, uh, so the cave uh, back propagates through upwards, it may be to surface or it may be to another cave that's sitting another cave or another mine sitting above it. And, and then eventually it would go through to surface. And as, it, as you keep on producing, so you'll develop a, what we call a cave substance zone. Uh, this, and I'll, I'll discuss each of these in a little bit more um, detail later. The main point uh, that I guess I'm trying to make is that as this cave uh, propagates, so it, it, it fragments and the cave goes to the surface, all of these fragments of all come out down below through, um, through um, these what we call draw, draw cones or draw bells. So down below here, you have all of these uh, draw cones. Think of it like an egg box, an upside down egg box or silos. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of these. Well, can be hundreds of these, and you you extract the ore, and as you extract the ore, so the cave propagates, and 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 so, so that's that's in a nutshell what a uh, my simplistic view of 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 what a cave mine looks like. So why do we use cave mining? Well, well, obviously, first of all, it uses um, the in situ stresses and gravity to break up the cave. So you don't use explosives. So it's a very low cost. Uh, mining method. It's very easy to mechanize. You can see that we just come down below and we can, once we've established it, we can draw um, large tons out of it. So once it's established, low cost, highly mechanized and can yield the large types of production rates that we need. Um, it does quite, it does require a lot of upfront capital to build, right? So, and this is the, this is one of the issues around caving that, that can make it a rather risky mining method is that although it has excellent operating, low operating costs to build it is a lot of capital you sink up front before you've even mined a ton. For example, if you go into, um, well, go into any of the, the caves into the, um, uh, going to Rio Tinto or Oya Tolgoy's website, you'll know that um, from what I was reading, Oya Tolgoy is probably around about capital spend of around $7 billion. And that's before we've even mined one ton of ore. So a lot of capital investment up front, which tends to, to get uh, investors nervous when, when, when um, things might not be going as well as hoped. <laughs> um, it's a comparatively safe mining method. There's not a lot of people underground. It's very mechanized. So it keeps people away from, if you like, the stopes. And it's, it's actually just simply the best suited method for extracting low grade, large deposits, and is able to deliver large quantities of minerals and, and materials to meet the, the demand of the future. Uh, that is if all goes well. <laughs> Um, so I just want to show you, just to excuse my um, cartoons here, but I wanted to give you an idea of where we're going in cave mining. And you can see uh, over the last 20 years, this is just a 
a really rough schematic of North Parks say, scale. Uh, we're looking at the first lift at North Parks was around 500 meters depth, had a footprint of about 200 by 200. Um, so a fairly efficient, 5 million tons a year, 20,000 tons a day, that sort of order. Uh, but then we, moving on, if you look at uh, Freeport, Cadelco, Cadia, they, they started getting a, a, a bit uh, more ambitious, a bit bigger. And if you look at the Freeport's uh, DOZK, for example, they were extracting in the, in the 2000s and its peak at about 80,000 tons a day. So quite big tons. But where we're going uh, into the future is even bigger. We're going deeper. Um, there's talk of, I mean, a lot of the where um, Cadia is going deeper and um, everywhere. I mean, uh, if you look at Oya Tolgwe, they 1,300 meters below surface resolution project. They're talking about 2,000 meters below surface. Uh, Kodelka is going deeper. So everybody's going deeper and bigger because they need to get the tons. As these big super pits are winding down, so we've got to get uh, the, the tons out. The problem is, though, going deeper is high stress environment, all sorts of uh, issues. And it's not a very, it's a very unforgiving environment. So there's not a lot of room for error, if you like, that we were able to, I guess, get away with in shallower deposits. So just an example of the scale. I uh, just thought they were good examples. The, the one on the left is a mine that's closed, the San Manuel mine in Arizona. It's a fairly large mine. If you look, it's, it's, it's almost 800 meters in strike and so on. Lots of what, the, this was sort of a panel cave. It was a bit of a hybrid. It, it, it was panels, but it was it broken up into uh, blocks. It was like a checkerboard system. The main point is that, you know, it's, it was, wasn't that deep, but it was quite big. But where we're going, if you look at um, the Freeport uh, system around in, in, um, in, in Indonesia, um, you know, currently they're finishing up the DOZ, they're mining the DMLZ, uh, they're going to be mining Kuching Liar soon. They've started the Grassberg Block Cave. Uh, all of these are going together. And, and the ultimately, if you look at the tonnages that are coming out per day, they're aiming and planning for around 300,000 tons per day from underground. So enormous. And, you know, that we, when we're talking about the development, even Oya Tolboy, I mean, it's, it's more than 200 kilometers of development up front before we've even started. And Freeport uh, are, is also in the hundreds of kilometers of development. So extensive capital, um, a, a big tonnages, a lot of problems still, you know, we, we're going deeper and, uh, and there are a lot of problems. So if I just want to look at, well, what are the, first of all, let's just look at the common problems facing any mining. And I'd say that the most common problem, if you like, that's sort of common to deep mines at depth is always around stress, right? It, it must be uh, other, there, there are other problems, but generally stress is a major one uh, where we have stability issues. Now, um, if we look at, uh, I've broken it up into sort of passive stress damage. So if we look at uh, damage induced by stresses, where we have high stress, we're deep, and the rock strength tends to be, um, I guess the strength stress ratio tends to be low, uh, obviously we will see a lot more um, stress-driven type failures. So you'll get spalling and slabbing, and, uh, and but it's easy to manage with ground support and with a little bit of smarts, how you orient your, your, your mine and your layouts. You can, you can generally manage that to, to a point. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the one of the problems that we can't manage as well is what we call more the dynamic induced stress damage. So this is the type of uh, dynamic failures like strain bursts and rock bursts. And you can imagine that, um, you know, where you have very more competent rocks under really high stress, you can imagine you're loading up a, a strong sample. You load it, you load it, you load it. And what happens is eventually it explodes, right? And that's exactly what happens underground is that we essentially explode. Um, and so it's a combination of, of, of um, the mechanical properties of the rock, major structures that might slip causing seismic events. And, and essentially the manifestation of that seismic event is to essentially explode the rock mass. So, and these aren't, um, like, these are common problems. And I'd like to just point out that Ortlip, um, Dave Ortlip um, did a lot of work in the South African gold mines and such. And, and he noted that, you know, rock burst problems have been around for almost a hundred years. Um, and we've been studying them quite, quite a lot in the last 50 years, uh, but we're still not there. We still don't seem to really be able to predict them 
to the level that we certain we're going to get a rock burst or should we move people out and so on so it's it's still we, we have come a long way i don't want to downplay that but we but we're not really where we should be if we're going to manage them um <clears throat> just the next thing i want to talk about just uh, quickly is rock mass characterization since I've been at the BRC, I realized rock mass characterization means different things to different um, people. So I'm talking about, I guess, rock mass as uh, more on the geomechanical type of understanding of, of what a rock mass is. So <clears throat> a rock mass is really, um, in essence, a rock mass is the process of describing the various constituents, right, of the rock mass and uh, and how these external loadings like stress or whatever uh, will have on that rock mass behavior. So typically, uh, when we um, wanting to mine a massive deposit, we need to develop a, a jet, what we call a geotechnical model. And that's compiled the various constituents like the lithology of the deposit, like the alteration, uh, understanding the strength, uh, the fracture frequency, all the, the jointing, the fabric, if you like the major structures, the hydrology, all of those models go into what we call the geotechnical model or the rock mass model. Um, how do we get that data? Well, we get it from a lot of rock testing, from logging, enormous amounts of logging, downhole geophysics, a lot of uh, pit mapping if we happen to have a pit or underground mapping at some stage. Uh, but whatever data we can collect goes into the, the, the construction of the of the various models and uh, it's very important because uh, in in essence what we're doing is we create what we term geotechnical domains where a domain is if you like a rock mass that has certain characteristics that when it's under certain loads and stresses will behave the same so in essence we're creating a a geotechnical model that comprises of various geotechnical domains and it's important that we that we can define this entire uh, volume that we want to cave uh, into into geotechnical domains and i'm not going to get into the details of how we do that uh, you've had other people come and talk to you about that but i want to try and explain some of the complexities around this so if we look at first of all as uh, benioski who is a good rock mechanics uh, guy from south africa at the time he said geological and rock mechanics data must be collected in sufficient quantity and of high quality. Data interpretation should be performed specifically uh, for the purpose of engineering design and innovative design approaches should be used to bring about improvements in productivity and safety. And I'd say in terms of performance as well. Now, why I'm saying that is if, if you look at um, the quality and the sufficiency, if you like, of data, it's again a, a, a problem because if you look at the enormous areas or, or volumes that we're trying to characterize, this is just an example. If I take Oya Tolboy uh, in Mongolia, we're talking about a block of ore that's 1300 meters down, it's about four kilometers in strike, and it's about, let's say, three or 400 meters wide. But it's not only that volume of ore that we have to characterize, it's, it's the host rock as well, because that's what we're going to subside. That's where we're going to locate our critical infrastructure. So it's enormous volume. How many holes do you have to drill to be able to characterize that deposit sufficiently, sufficiently to be able to produce a reliable model? Uh, it's enormous. It's, it's an enormous amount that we need. And what people have been doing is that, well, they've just been overwhelmed, really. So although we do a lot of drilling and all sorts of data collection, um, unfortunately, what I've seen is a lot of uh, geotechnical models that are simply RQD models. What is RQD? Um, for those of you who don't know, RQD is simply a measure of the damage of the rock. It's saying that any piece of rock in the core that's less than 10 centimeters is, is connected. So what you've got is a percentage of the core run where the pieces of core are greater than 10 centimeters. Okay, that's, that's all it is. So it's an indicator of damage, but it's a very poor indicator of damage because as a lot of the geologists here will know is that the, ge the, the drilling process breaks up core. <laughs> and not only that, if you look at my little example here, if you have, uh, say, a joint spacing or vein spacing, that's just under 10 centimeters, well, you can get everything. For, if you drill a hole in one direction and you drill a hole in another direction, you could have everything from an RQD of zero to an RQD of 100 and everything in between. So, I mean, that might seem like a, an exaggeration, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's not really, because if you look at these pieces of um, these core boxes here, 
all of those core boxes have an RQD of zero. And I'm pretty sure I know which one I want to develop my tunnel in, and it's not going to be the top one. So my, my point is that uh, RQD is not a sufficient measure of rock quality. And unfortunately, I'd say it's relied on too, too much for the development of geotechnical models. And we base all of our, our modeling and our predictions on, on, those, on those models. The other thing I, I wanted to point out is when you um, try to characterize as particularly a caving deposit, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it's an enormous volume and, it, and it, it covers a wide range of data. Now, trying to make that point is that when we're looking at doing an analysis of cave propagation or caveability or subsidence predictions, we really need to understand the major structures. I mean, that's probably obvious. We need to know the, the rock fabric, the joints, as well as all the, the strength data. Um, we need the same sort of data for tunnels or excavations underground, but when we come to try and predict fragmentation of the cave, we need to get right down into the micro defects because that's what governs how those rocks break up. So what I'm trying to point out is that the, the extreme scale of the data is everything from major structures down to micro defects are important in to be able to correctly characterize the deposit and be able to predict performance. So, you know, simply collecting RQD or a few points is just not going to cut it if we're going to do it properly. Just really want to touch on some of the key drivers of cave mining and, and how they're going to, how the problems facing them at depth. First of all, undercutting, as I said, what, that's the process whereby we create a continuous uh, uh, scope, uh, a continuous, uh, if you like, stope underground. And uh, the, at the base of the footprint, so we cut this this uh, the stope out, and it's located at the bottom of the extraction level, and it's connected by the draw bells to the cave. Now, the purpose of the undercut uh, is to mine that slice of ore out, so that you can induce caving in the rock mass. So you've got to undercut a big enough area to sustain caving and keep on caving, right? So the, the undercut is, is a critical component of the, the performance and the success of a cave. The problem is when we go deeper, what we've got is um, a lot of stress problems, which is what I, which I was talking about. So when you when you um, are uh, using a lot of, you know, obviously this is the, the drill and blast part of the cave, the only drill and blast part of the cave where you create the undercut. So under high stresses, uh, you have a lot of issues. So there's a lot of high stresses on the undercut. And so you get a whole lot of issues like uh, drill hole, blast hole dislocations. You have really daggy brow conditions when you go to charge the face. Even with autonomous charging, it's still a problem. You have accessibility problems. You can't get to where you need to be because the cave rolls down and you can't get to the holes. So what the guys do is they, they don't always, they can't always deal with that. So they just step back and put more explosives in and let it go and she'll be right. So that, that's, that's typically the approach. It's, it's, it's a problem. And why is it a problem is because, well, we don't always, when we have that type of issue where we can't charge the holes, we have bad conditions, uh, that, that creates what we call remnant pillars in the undercut, like the one I'm showing there. Now, you might not think, well, that's not really a problem. It's a small pillar. Um, and uh, why should we worry about it? Um, well, it, if you create enough of those in the cave on the undercut, it'll just stop. It'll just support the cave. We won't. We call them span interrupts. It, it will stop the cave from propagating. So it's, it's really important that we don't develop pillars in an undercut. And uh, the other, the other big issue with these pillars is that yes, they the, the load eventually becomes so great on them that they will crush. They'll crush out. But uh, as you, would, you can imagine. Um, I always try and think of the analogy of a stiletto versus a moccasin. If, if, if your friend stands on your foot with a moccasin, you're, you're okay. But if they stand on you with a stiletto, you tend to feel, feel it a little more than a moccasin, right? And that's because the stresses are transmitted through that little pillar much greater. So what happens is uh, the undercuts develop to create, we have some of these remnant pillars and all the stresses gets trans transmitted through uh, as a, like a conduit of stress down. And of course that goes straight down into the tunnels below and just crushes them like you wouldn't believe. So um, these are just examples, Kimberley, uh, Argyle and other places where we've had 
uh, the stresses uh, breaking up the levels below, simply from little pillars like that. Um, and also these pillars are low key for, um, for large seismic events. You can imagine that they will eventually burst causing uh, seismic events and that can also be a problem. So undercutting a problem is definitely, uh, undercutting a depth is definitely a problem. What about the cave propagation? Is that any different? Well, it's one thing when I first started doing caving analysis, uh, all I had to worry about, I came out of De Beers, the rock was pretty soft, we're pretty shallow. All we needed to worry about was what we called cave ability. Will the rock cave? It's the ability of the rock mass to cave. But when we're going deeper, it's far more complex uh, than uh, just simply predicting cave ability. It, uh, not only do we have to predict how big that area needs to be, uh, but we also really have to predict how that cave is going to grow. What's the shape of the cave that's propagating? It's not good enough just to say, well, the rock mass will cave down at the bottom. We want to know, well, is that rock mass going to continue to cave all the way through? And what's the shape of that? And why do we care? These are just some examples. That's parks. Uh, that's uh, Cadia. Just taking those out of papers. That's an unmentioned mine, uh, but the point is that you'll notice that you get to tend to, tend to get these uh, witches' hats forming, we call them. And the, these witches' hats just simply means the cave, because of the aspect ratio of, the, of this cave propagation, eventually sort of peters out. Uh, and... Uh, it may stall because the area up near the top might just be too small, too constrained, too confined to continue, in which case you get an air gap forming. But the, the biggest, I guess most of them will fail. And the, the issue then is that, well, we've left a whole bunch of ore on the sides that we never get again, because you know, as that cave propagates, as the cartoon showed, it tends to fill up with broken material, which buttresses the sides of that cave. And so we don't, we don't necessarily get that material. It's there for forever unless we go and somehow extract it. So we're talking about, uh, with these high columns, we're talking about more ore loss around the peripheries of the cave. What about fragmentation? How does that change with depth? Um, when I talk about fragmentation, I'm really talking about how does the rock, how, how big is the rock? How, what is the fragmentation distribution in the cave? Now, typically um, we, we normally do fragmentation analysis in the cave. We take, get all the joints and the rock mass strength and we come up with a, an estimate, a, a predictive estimate of what that rock mass will form in situ. And then what we call primary fragmentation, Primary fragmentation simply means when the stresses have broken that in situ block and it falls into the cave, that's what we call primary fragmentation. Secondary fragmentation is obviously when that block moves through the cave, it, it suffers all sort of the comminution and so on and breaks down further. That's what we call secondary. Now, in, in our um, more... Um, previous mines where we have shallower mines, fragmentation is, is important because we're really trying to get an idea of how big the rocks are going to be, because that's going to be the bottleneck to production. It's also going to be a blasting problem and all the rest. You've got big blocks, rocks blocking your, all, your um, draw points. They tend to uh, slow things down and, and reduce uh, your productivity. So it was important. But nowadays, I guess you can imagine that as a stress-driven failures down deep, we don't get big blocks forming. Typically, we just get really small blocks forming. Um, not only that, but if you think of a block that's moving down uh, a thousand meter ore column, it tends to break up, which is not a surprise. You, you mill guys know that very well and uh, rocks tend to break. And also just, just the load of the column itself is enough to split those rocks. So. We, we, we typically get, we've got a term for it in caving, it's called bug dust, and that's about <laughs> the description of it. Um, now, we would think most engineers say, well, what are you worried about? You butte, we can just load to our heart's content, we've got no bottlenecks. The problem is that fragmentation is absolutely key to how this rock mass flows. So the flow mechanics, which I'll get to next, is governed by the average size of the fragmentation within the cave. So why is flow so important? Now, just just a, a very quick um, explanation of, of flow mechanics. I guess what I want to point out is that 
when you, if you had a model or, or using sandboxes, whatever, in fact, uh, I think they were, uh, probably in your time, uh, Tim, Gavin Power and Roel Castro, they had a huge, great, big um, uh, uh, physical model out the back of JK where they're looking at flow, a flow of material and, and how uh, the draw, how these draw cones, we call them, develop. What are draw cones? Essentially, they, the, the, they these ellipsoidal sort of shapes where um, the particles, as you draw them, form, they, they, they're the limits of movement, if you like, of the material that's moving. So as you draw below, you create all this material in, in yellow moves. Okay, that's what you eventually extract. It's, it's, it's these cones that form. So that's what we're trying to show you here. So we need to place these, these cones, we need to space them. So as we draw, they, uh, if you like, they touch, they, they, they coalesce so that they interact. We call that interaction. And that's fundamental to the design of a cave. We have to design it so that these draw cones interact. Why? So just want to make a point. So excuse my, car, my um, artistic uh, license, always struggle a little bit. Essentially, if you can think of these cones, that the, the, the size of the fragmentation dictates the shape of these draw cones. So where you have a coarse fragmentation, you'll get very wide draw cone, very squat, doesn't propagate very high. But if you've got very fine fragmentation, you get incredibly narrow draw cones, right? And uh, these draw cones, uh, if you draw this, so assuming you've drawn the same tonnages, you, in, in a fine draw cone, it'll tend to propagate very fast up the column and but very narrow so why why would that matter well simply because when you design a cave you design for cave interaction you design for draw cone interaction so what you want is you want to space your draw points close enough so that you get interaction and why is that important because that's how you control your recoveries that's how you control a dilution what you're trying to do is induce mass flow into the cave and you do that by spacing your draw points as close together as possible. Now you can understand that um, if you're deep, well, spacing your draw points too close is a problem because now it's a stability issue and stresses can't, they'll just crush these pillars. So you wanna increase these pillars between the draw points so that they can sustain the weight and the, the stresses. But now you've got a, a bit of a conundrum because, um, you will, you'll get a different flow behavior happening in the cave. What you have is ice, what we call isolated draw. And isolated draw does not facilitate mass flow. In other words, what you have is if you had way sitting down, you get uh, a, a much more rapid uh, velocity, if you like, within a narrow cone. You, you're drawing large tons over a smaller volume, smaller area. So you, you get the material moving at a much greater velocity. So what, what does that mean? It means that if you've got waste sitting above you, it's going to come into your draw points really fast. And that's a problem, right? So it te you tend to always have waste sitting above you. That's, that's why you're using CAD. So it's, it's a bit of a problem. The, the other problem that people tend to overlook, because as we're going deeper, people say, oh, we'll just increase the draw point spacing and she'll be right. But the problem is she's not right because what happens, not only do you get early dilution and more of it, but you can imagine that that this, these stagnant pillars, if you like, that form between the draw points start to get compacted. And when they start to get compacted, they start to carry stress and load above. And th all that stress, stress then gets transmitted down below. Ideally, if you've got um, an interactive, uh, this is what this is trying to show, that the, the stresses get uh, transmitted through these, into these sort of pillars, if you want to call them that. By, and uh, that's what you're trying to avoid because um, what happens if, if they do get transmitted is you tend to get this type of thing. So again, it's, it's, uh, these are just showing you uh, cave mines that have been crushed, uh, draw, po draw points that have been crushed uh, and just, you know, just damaged because of the weight if, of that. And the problem is um, with that is you can imagine uh, that's going to be out of commission for the next couple of months, which means that all that material sitting above it is, guess what? It's compacting and transmitting load. So it's almost, we call it a cancer. You know, it's, it's literally a cancer that grows because you can't manage it. If you can't draw it, you can't relieve the stress. If you can't relieve the stress, it, it gets bigger and bigger. So a huge problem. And, and very often, the only thing you can do is you just concrete everything closed and you, 
you try and rehab it eventually you try and draw around it you try and relieve stress and you get back in the other problem as i said early dilution this is a famous picture taken out of north parks uh, lift two uh, of their one of their caves and you, that's clay saprolite clay and unfortunately uh, that caused hell on the material handling system, you can imagine. Uh, you, we could have pottery classes down there at the time. But, but it, it was a real problem. <clears throat> and that's the type of problem that we should see more and more as our fragmentation finds as we go deeper. Um, <clears throat> what about subsidence? Well, well really, um, I guess subsidence is not something that's unique or different to deep mines. However, there, there are other issues with cave substance I just want to touch on. Um, so where we site our um, infrastructure around the cave is obviously important. Uh, this is showing you, um, there is a cave down below. This is Palabora. It's just showing um, how we induced uh, failure in that pit. The pit was finished, so it's not as though we stopped pit operations, uh, but it did cause a big failure that wasn't predicted. I, I actually remember working on this when I was still working for Anglo and that, and guess where we first located those uh, shafts? It happened to be <laughs> over there last minute. Somebody rolled the dice and said, oh, I think we should move it over here. Uh, who knew? But, uh, um, but at the time, I mean, one of the things to worry about is there's a, there's a tailings dam and, and there were power lines and there was a rail. The, the issue was, um, you know, we've got to predict substance, obviously, get it right. And uh, there are always implications. Uh, and, uh, and the other interesting thing about that is that's not our mine or wasn't our mine. It was somebody else's mine. So you're affecting their production, their tailings dams. Now, it tends to create a, 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 well, generates money for the legal uh, team. But at the end of the day, um, <clears throat> citing it is, is very important. And, uh, and I just want, I think, I think where we're going, it's not a deep stress, deep cave problem, but where we're going is we're going to have enormous ESG constraints placed on subsidence. Now, I tend to think a cave subsidence zone is far smaller in area than a large open pit, say, so I think it's actually a good thing. But nevertheless, people um, don't like subsidence in their backyard. And, um, you know, there's always a question of how it affects uh, subterranean well, waterways, surface waterways, there's, there's all those environmental considerations for any mine, but, but they, they will impact on, on what we prepare to accept in the future. And there's always this question is, can you rehabilitate a substance zone? And, you know, if, 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 if De Beers is anything to go by, the way they rehab it is they create a little old town and put a, uh, a bit of a, um, uh, a viewing platform on it and make it a, a tourist attraction. But that's not, I guess, going to cut it everywhere. Uh, there's got to be more. Uh, just showing you some examples of these subsidence zones and what we're facing. Um, the top one is, uh, again, Kimberley, South Africa, De Beers operation. There's two caves. Uh, just showing you the extent. There's the mine building. So, yeah, we're starting to, over time, it doesn't crouch. That's th this one below, that's the town of Kimberley in South Africa. And that's what they call the big hole. It was a diamond mine. Fantastic place to visit. I mean, it's hundreds, 100 years plus years old. Uh, but I know because when I was, I did some monitoring around that pit. And I can tell you that it's still, it's still failing. We're having to move rail. We're having to buy um, some of the industry uh, buildings over there. This is uh, Karuna LKB. That's their township. I mean, all of these townships have developed around the mines, but now we're having to move people, buy their houses and so on. So the impact of substance on community is real and it will continue to be. So um, my point is that um, we really have to be working on how we can constrain the growth of cave subsidence into the future yeah so just um some of the how, how do we solve this and and i guess um one of the solutions in terms of mining methods it's simply we just can't keep cut and pasting the designs that we've used in the past taking that down to the bottom maybe increasing the pillar size and hoping for the best it's it's not not uh, it's not well i don't think it's a feasible solution we really need to look at different mining methods or different hybrids. Uh, for example, this is just taken from the, the recent Chuki Kamata uh, uh, plan where they're breaking what they call macro blocks. They're breaking up that footprint into smaller, if you like, smaller little caves with pillars in between. And they're hoping that that would help, um, 
I guess, carry the load and the stresses on these sacrificial pillars between the blocks. And that's one way, or, uh, uh, you know, there might be ways that you might have smaller, break it up into smaller block caves and the pillars then, the interblock pillars then get extract, extracted on the next level down, if you know what I mean. So you've got to factor all these things in. In my opinion, though, we're not really dealing with the problem. And the problem is, is how do we keep it stable and ensure recovery? So I, I really believe we've got to change our mining method slightly. And this is an example of something proposed by Loebscher uh, and guest and him. And, it's called an incline cave. And essentially, it's, you can think of it like a block cave, but spread up in, in three dimensions. So you have multiple levels of recovery, like a sub-level cave, in effect. But what you're doing is that you, you're ensuring stability, but you're also, by, by offsetting and staggering the, the different elevations, you, you may improve recovery. So I, I, I might not be obvious. Um, the, the, the really ironical thing about this is that um, where I grew up in an asbestos mine in Zimbabwe, that, that method was being used in the 50s. <laughs> but, but it could be really applicable uh, to now. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we come to the marketing side. I guess I, I want to just, just, just discuss <laughs> a little bit of what we're trying to achieve in, in DMG and how we want to uh, address some of these um, issues. Which, which I've presented today. So the first one in terms of um, the, the geoscience characterization, I've called it geoscience rather than geotechnical, geological, because it's, it's, there's many components to this. And we really believe that we have to improve the, the quality and, and the quantity of data. And uh, I know that we, we do a great job of collecting all sorts of data, but one of the criticisms lay, um, always comes back, we don't use the data. We're not using all the data. Why are we collecting all this data? So I really believe that we need to better integrate all of the data we're getting and process that data. We need a lot more of it. So we've got to integrate, better integrate the ATV with the hyperspectral, with the logging, the mapping. Uh, so we, 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 let's call it data fusion, if you like, um, so that we can get as much out uh, of the data collection as possible. We're simply not going to be able to drill enough holes in the time uh, that we need to be able to characterize those large deposits. It's just probably not feasible. Uh, we, we, although we will do our best, you can, uh, I know, for example, that to drill one hole deep down to two kilometers um, costs a few million dollars, at least a couple of million dollars. And even then to keep it open so that we can get good data is always a challenge, you know. So how quickly can you drill those holes and how many do we need? You know, so we need more technologies and, and uh, we need to, we need to uh, harness all of the, that to, and, and merge that. Uh, we need to develop uh, tools to automate the process. We're really looking at you know, tools to automate the, the ATV logging and so on. Um, and uh, that, that needs to improve uh, uh, with a lot of, lot of other softwares like the hyperspectral work and, and so on. But then we also need to improve our statistical analysis of the data. We need to be able to uh, recognize that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's tools that can quantify whether you've got enough data, right, and the quality of the data. And I'm sure Tim could speak to that better than, than me, but, but there are good geostatistical tools. We need to be able to use them to quantify data sufficiency and adequacy, and, and also incorporate uh, the, the variability of the data and the uncertainty into these geotechnical models. It's really important. I believe that the outcome of that will be to help, say, the jaw code, for example, to be able to say, Look, you know, you can't just say it's 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 um you know you, what do they what do you call it uh, modifying factors? We can be far more specific about what we mean by that. I'll try and speed it up a little. I'm sorry, running a bit late. Um, rock mass conditioning. This is where we will try and engineer the rock mass response. So you you saw me showing you uh, the cave stalls or ore losses. Well, we can use technologies like hydraulic fracturing to improve the rock mass. Uh, failure, if you like, or, or performance of the cave. Uh, but we really need to understand what we're doing. And, and I, I know that we've successfully applied technologies like hydraulic fracturing to preconditioned rock masses, but I'm not convinced we know why it works <laughs> as well as it does. And, and we need to know whether we can apply those technologies to deeper and will they work? Because stresses will dictate how effective that hydraulic fracturing process is 
and that's something uh, we really need to get into more. Uh, in terms of uh, risks, uh, I really believe that be able to identify, quantify, and effectively manage the geohazard. Uh, we can do that through a lot through back analysis of our existing mine monitoring. We, we, we've got a lot of models, but we don't have, we're not very good at back analyzing all the data and people don't, at site don't always have the time and so on. So what I'm suggesting is that, you know, there's a lot of excellent data out there that we can use and analyze properly, statistically to come up with, uh, really identify some of the key hazard indicators that we need to be able to generate a hazard model. And we've come a long way with that, but it just needs more work. Um, and then also we need to understand, uh, we need to incorporate these hazards into our models. So into our predictive models, for example, if we know that the, um, we, we're gonna have, um, dilution issues because our draw points are so, spaced so far, well, then we need to incorporate that into our planning, uh, into our hazard models. If we know we're going to get crushing of draw points, we need to incorporate that so that um, we can better predict the, uh, the performance of the caves, right? Um, I guess we also need to be able to predict, um, uh, improve the, the methodologies for incorporating uh, I guess all of our monitoring data into these models so that in real time, we can manage um, the hazard. For example, not only seismic events and rock bursts, but we've now got cave trackers uh, that are, um, are spinning magnets at Mining 3 and so on have developed. We need to be able to use that data in real time to dictate our, how we draw the cave. We, we can actually see what, what's, mo what's moving uh, in, the, in the rock column. We need to be able to uh, change our draw strategy appropriately. This is where we come to sort of cave flow, which I've already spoken about. We need to understand how draw cones form at depth and we don't really uh, understand that. So the, the impact of stress and depth on the formation of these draw cones. So we needed to do perhaps another uh, physical model that people like Gavin Power did, but you know, in some way be able to simulate or emulate the, the, the stresses that, that govern the flow of that. Um, the other thing is how do we effectively draw that cave to, to shed the stresses so that we don't get crushing out uh, of the of the tunnels and the draw points below. And yeah, and then how do we manage this all in real time if we can? Finally, I, I just want to say we, we really need to do work on the mining methods themselves. As I said, you know, we need to develop robust alternatives uh, to mining methods that allow us to be able to mine at depth, be able to mass mine at depth. Uh, not only ensuring the stability, but also ensuring the recoveries. And there, there, there is potential solutions to that. There has been some work in that, that area and um, we expect more, but we also need to develop tools that allow us to test those new methods, right? So at the moment we, we generate methods, but we need a way of saying, well, what is the, how, how, how good is that gonna be for stability or how good is that gonna be for recovery? We need methods to quantify the success if you like, of, an, of the new mining methods. Um, the other thing we really need to do, as I've said before, we, we need to try and look at putting tailings back into our active caves to reduce the substance, not only reduce the substance effects, but that's what it'll do, but it'll have a huge um, impact on reducing substance. Now we've been doing that for closed caves, but we haven't really done it on active caves. And we don't do that because of uh, I guess the impacts of, of water down below and potential for mud rushes and so on. So we've got to look at this, um, uh, you know, in, in more depth and uh, for, for active caves and holistically. And finally, we also need to look at, uh, investigate further techniques like hydraulic fracturing in combination, not only to precondition the rock mass, but to look at integrating that perhaps with, with technologies like the in-situ leaching. So for example, where we've got sterilized ore because we had early dilution, we still got ore there. Well, how, how can we get that? Perhaps we can use the in-situ leaching type to recover these ore losses. So we might have to accept that we have all losses, but we have different technologies that we can in, in, incorporate that allow us to, to maximize the recovery of that. Um, so yeah, just in conclusion, uh, just wanna reiterate that, you know, 
the deep mass mining, whatever it is, but especially caves, it, it really demands good, reliable geo models. And we don't have those. We need to be able to develop good models that we can use to reliably predict and quantify the performance of the cave. And we need, and, and the risks. So we, we need to improve on that. We certainly need to improve the cave performance um, through rock mass preconditioning, um, for example, or rock mass conditioning. And we need to be able to know exactly what's going on so we can better design it for depth. Um, of course, we need to be able to manage and predict these geo risks at depth much in, in much more certainty because they're going to be more common. And we um, need to understand the effects, I guess, like I've said, of high stress and big column heights on the, the draw cones. And uh, these are things I think we can do right now. Um, also, we also need to develop a ro more robust mining method, as I've said, as I've already said. So I'm repeating myself. But what I'm saying is we've got to change. We, we just cannot cut and paste the same old stuff that we've been doing for the last 50 years and uh, get that point. Uh, I don't know if it was Einstein who did say that, but certainly it's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a, a different result. That's clearly not going to work. So, yeah, thank you. And uh, I hope I hope you got something out of that. <laughs> thank you, Andre. I'm certain we have a few questions here in the audience and we definitely have questions online. Thanks, Andre. That was really interesting. Um, from your comment on the state of the geo models that we have at the moment, is that an issue of the current technologies? Can, can I, the takeaway I sort of got there is we can't cost effectively develop the geo models we have with the technology we currently have or are applying? Like, do we need a whole new tool to measure different rock properties on, you know, volume of rock underground? Look, it's both, right? I, I thought that it was a technology issue. Um, certainly, for example, um, uh, when I was working at Rio, um, we started off, you know, it was really pushing the use of uh, uh, downhole geophysics because we weren't using that properly. So getting even at an exploration phase to do ATV down the hole gave me an enormous advantage down the track. Now, yes, it's an expense, but it was just a matter of doing, doing it. I mean, uh, photographing the core, the core scanning, all of that. I mean, a lot of that early core is thrown away. It's, it's sitting somewhere, but nobody knows, and it's, it's deteriorated and so on. So it's a bit of both. And, and to be honest, when I, when I um, started my own company and started doing reviews on that, I was absolutely shocked at, the, at, at what people were using in the model. So I think that a lot of the technology is there, um, and a lot of people are doing a great job, but some are doing a terrible job. And, and for all sorts of reasons, mostly resourcing, having the people. I mean, when I first did detailed geotech logging, it used to take me approximately 10 meters a day for uh, 10, 10 meters a core a day. <laughs> I, and I, I, but that's because I'm collecting micro defects and faults, right? I mean, that's the level we, we have to automate that process to speed it up. So, it's a bit of both, you know, I, I mean, even though I did that in detail and I was absolutely, I, I used to at best, at best uh, uh, log t in detail 20% of the holes, you know, because it's just resource constraint. I think it's both. We've got an online question here, and then we'll go back to the, to the audience. Well, first of all, there's a statement here from um, Bill Adamson. No question, but deep thanks. No pun intended. I don't believe him. I think there was a pun intended there for a great, thorough, and digestible presentation. I learned a great deal. Cheers. And then uh, from Marcin, uh, thanks for the presentation, Andre. In slide 25, you mentioned draw cones, flow geometry. I know there's been a lot of cave flow modeling work. Are we totally confident of this geometrical cone behavior at scale? through direct measurements and observations, or is it model based on computer flow, or is this model based on computer flow modeling and small scale physical models? 
Yeah, and I, I've done a lot of work in that area. I worked with Dion Weatherly uh, using ESIS particle, uh, worked with Artasca. So we, we, we certainly have used models, but these models predated uh, those models. So they were sandbox experiments that uh, Panek did uh, and Loebsche did. You know, they were, the first of that was based on sand, sand sandboxes. And, and so we always questioned, in my mind, it does, it is granular flow, and we have simplified it to granular flow. And that is a problem because all of the numerical and physical models inherently have a porosity as such. So that it doesn't really capture um, the, the semi in situ nature of that whole column. You know, it, it might, it does capture it at the end when everything's caved through and you've got a big bin with an inherent porosity, then you might be able to to simulate that, but but it's a lot more complex than that up front. And so um, I, I, I think that there's a bit of both there. I do think it's an oversimplification of flow. And I know because since we've had a lot of these electronic markers and cave trackers, we've learned a hell of a lot. And also just more in depth though. So I know it's more complicated and we've got some, uh, I think we've come a long way and we've got some good theories and, and, that, and, and that we're using to validate now using data. I, I, uh, to, to answer Marston's question, I guess, I really think that the solution to this is not more modeling. I think the solution, well, there, there will be some, but I think the solution is to use the data that we have collected, the good electronic tags and some markers data over the last 20 years to help us back analyze that. I think that's the key. Uh, and also going forward, I, I don't think more modeling because it's inherently a problem. I mean, I can mine the whole North Parks before uh, Dion's finished using, uh, my, uh, running it in, in ESIS, right? It's just a complex uh, problem. Sorry, I'm going to jump in and do, this is going to be a bit of a Dorothy Dixer question. So, so I don't think um, it was mentioned at the start that this is a very, very, it's, a, it's our newest program probably in the SMI um, and really only started in November. So, I guess my question is, um, how would you see industry partners getting involved in this research program going forward? Yeah, right. So certainly I have, <clears throat> as you point out, I, I have produced a white paper for industry. Um, I, I did first, I went out to the industry and I said, look, these are the problems I think we've got. Uh, do you agree? What do you think the problems are? And uh, I've had a response by uh, at least 17 uh, big mining companies now. They're all, they're all um, most are, are agreeing with me and, and most are, are, um, uh, are on board. They, they recognize some of these problems and well, all of the problems. And we're looking at trying to prioritize the, I guess, the feedback from these companies to be able to you know, formulate a, a, a probably a more uh, customized or, or detailed uh, proposal. I've already put forward uh, some proposals there. Got, uh, like I said, I produced the white paper, set out the problems, suggested key research areas, and have now getting all the feedback. And uh, uh, a lot of companies uh, have had uh, feedback from the, uh, many companies, but a lot of them have promised sort of mid March. March sometime, I'll, I'll get most of that. So we've tried to, I guess, in a, a long, long uh, story shorter, we've, we've approached all the mining companies to just validate and check that we're on the right track as far as this type of research is concerned. And I think that we've got most of them on board. Uh, I think how, what that looks like is still to be decided based on the priorities that have been recommended. Right. Thanks, Andre. As a metallurgist, uh, I think I'm now I'm an instant expert on, on caving. Appreciate the, the, your insights. Um, you, you focus a lot on the design aspects. What about operational aspects of e existing uh, caves, you know, for managing draw points and re <clears throat> reduce, do you, do you do it to grade or to tonnage? Is that uh, yeah. old uh, adage? Yeah. It <clears throat> Yes, you're right. I do focus on design, but I'm very much an operations person. Um, the problem is it's an inflexible method. Once it's designed and built, all you've got to control everything is draw down below. If you screw up the design, <laughs> 
it's, it's a bad place to be. You, you don't have the flexibility to change. So the emphasis on design should be there, right? I mean, but obviously there are uh, operational implications and, and um, certainly operational implications sometimes drives the design anyway. So, you know, I can't, uh, if you can imagine the, the, the um, a very big one, a very good example is the, 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 the draw from the, 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 how you systematically draw the cave to try and ensure mass flow and ensure that you can relieve stress and all that type of thing is very much an operational uh, problem, but uh, it's something that, yeah, it, it's, it's uh, we spend a lot of time on the operation side and that's where the monitoring comes back because it's, it's very difficult to monitor a cave. It's a, it's a very harsh environment, and it's it's difficult to know what you're doing. And I think technology has come a, a great way to help uh, on the operational side. But like I said, the um, there is there is some limited, if you like, operational response to some of the problems because once it's built, it's built, and and then you all you can do really is draw it, and how you draw it is key to try to minimize the the damage, if you like. Hi, Andre. Great talk. That was really informative. Thank you. Um, I guess this is a question from back in the days when I had to take geotech data. And in reality, in the real world, there's a lot of inconsistencies in who in the quality of the data. Like a geologist is going to take different information to a fieldy, different information to a geotech engineer because a lot of the time from my experience the geotech engineers were not the people taking their data and my question was always and I could not find the answer to that is there a streamline guidelines some sort of geotech for dummies where everyone could at least try and collect similar data and the most helpful data for geotech engineer because I, I honestly tried to find and could not find it. Yes, there is. I got a geotech for geologists, um, but the the I spent a lot of time um, working uh, logging core. Um, you're right. Um, geotechnical engineers don't tend to get to the core shed nearly as much as they should. And in fact, part of when at least when I was in charge, they did. Um, uh, we really pushed that because it's absolutely it, geology is fundamental. Geologists did the best job of lot, but the geotech needed to be there to do the geotech. And so I spent a lot of time. I've got training manuals to explain why we collect and how we collect. Uh, I found the technicians that we used were, were the best at collecting the data, but they really only when people understood why did they enjoy it. But, but most of the time, I mean, it's a thankless job uh, 10 meters a day i mean you know you go nuts right but it's um but it's 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 if people understand more so there is and this is also part of the reason why we wanted to automate that process because the quality is far far ranging and and uh, you know it's not it's, it's unsurprising that you might have a big turnover in in that area and uh and typically we always put the most junior Unexperienced, inexperienced person in those roles, right? Uh, but but we we spend a lot of time building and training. So I, I I've got uh, manuals and and things that and slides. And I, when I used to go to site, I used to spend a lot of time in the core shed, um, and and we try to emphasise that. But it is it is a problem, and the geotech should be there, shoulder to shoulder with the geologist logging core, and. Uh, there's not there's not really a, a way around it, but but it always helps if people know why. And uh, I, yeah, it's an educational thing. In fact, I, I think and I was talking to Rick and them about it. Is I think we need um, yeah, the UQ would be great to have a core logging course, right? I'll volunteer you for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is, and so we need to automate the process. We need to use some of the automatic, the, the core scanning, the ATVs and all that to help speed it up. And we are, we, you know, if I've got a resolution, I've got ATVs and the core right there. 
um, so I can see what I'm doing. And I think that's part of the quality that we're getting um, to come through now, you know, and improving those processes. I, Sorry, I'm getting confused. I'm overwhelmed with questions today. Yes, I, I, I thought that was fascinating stuff, my Ray. Thanks. And I think you buy it. <laughs> the, the, as, as an old geologist, the geological challenges uh, of, for optimizing this mine method uh, are, are really quite staggering. I mean, and it and the inflexibility of the program once you're committed to it is, uh, is, is impressive stuff and would certainly uh, uh, ob obligate geologists to make the maximum usage of drill core, because that really is one of the key things. That specifically, the draw points. This really is determining how the, the operation is going to work. Is, is there a, a rule of thumb or to what extent, to what extent is, the, is geological other input uh, a, a factor in the spacing of your draw points? Or is it these days pretty much still a rule of thumb? No, 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 not at all. I mean, the, uh, once we're down there, we're obviously mapping. Uh, so the geomechanics side, the, the, the structure, the geology, all of that is, 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 is determined. We use that to, to look at that rock mass. So we, we try and build that rock mass picture up. And uh, you must remember, it's not just one rock mass. It's highly variable. I mean, you've got a lot of alteration effects. You've got structures, major structures, faults. So the problem with caving, it's inflexible in that you need a spacing, you need a layout. And it doesn't matter what the rock is, it's going to be the same generally across the entire level. So what you try and design for, I guess, is uh, you've got to take into account that in some of the weaker parts of the rock, you can't have small draw points, you know. And so it's not, it's not a rule of thumb. It's, we do a lot of numerical modeling uh, to look at the stresses that will um, be generated on those pillars and on those tunnels. Uh, to to try and make sure that I guess the, the the first and foremost the stability is guaranteed as much as we can do. So we do a lot of modelling. All of that geology and geotechnical mapping we do goes into the model to help calibrate it, and then we simulate the the uh, the, the, the process, the undercut process, and the impacts of stability on that. So using the numerical models, we, we tend to decide on what draw point spacing is. We, we originally have a, a rough rule of thumb empirical design, but normally that is superseded by new, uh, stress models, numerical models that we look at. Um, and that's how we, 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 um, we space our draw points. Unfortunately, the stress models don't do a good job of, of telling you what the recoveries would be for your nice, pretty big, stable, uh, draw points with wide spacings. They might handle the stresses better, but they certainly don't handle uh, the recovery side. And that's where we use other models. And that's very much uh, a, um, in terms of recoveries, uh, that's a little bit of an art because um, a lot of the inputs on the model, uh, the premise is that you get interactive draw right up front. <laughs> so you, you simulate recoveries, but they've really built in the fact that you're going to grow wide enough to to get mass flow. And I think that's, that's the problem is I don't, there are people that do constrain the flow model, the, 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 the predictive flow models to try and emulate more isolated draw, but it, you can imagine they don't tend to, uh, it's, it's not a very attractive proposition to demonstrate how much dilution you might get in uh, early on, you know, so uh, I guess I'm saying that it is done, but perhaps not done, uh, to, to the extent that it should be. And that's why I was proposing that we need to come up with some good guidelines for JORC to say, this is how we go about looking at resource recoveries in a cave. And this is what you need to consider. You need to consider the fact that 10% of your draw points might've crushed out and draw zero right up front, right? That type of thing needs to be in the models as well. Uh, I hope I'm answering your question. Um, it's not empirical, 
or, or rule of thumb. It tends, tends to be numerical modeling that, that, that dictates it. Thank you, Andre. Thanks once again. Um, we still have quite a few questions online and, and here in the audience, but maybe if I could suggest people online, maybe email you <laughs> for you to answer, um, and then we can continue the conversation over tea and biscuits without running the, the Zoom session. So thanks, everyone. Thank you. And uh, next week, we've got um, Andrew Job from Plot Logic, based here in Brisbane who's gonna give us an enigmatically um, titled presentation from research to commercialization. So we'll be talking about the, the company and the services that they do. Yep. <laughs> Thanks everyone.